All right, hey guys, happy start of the week, happy Monday. And if you're seeing something different today, well, uh, things didn't go as planned again. Uh, we are not broadcasting on um, Facebook anymore, so we're just uh, on YouTube exclusively. For what reason, I actually do not know. So uh, ever since uh, that issue with uh, Jason's episode with the copyright thing, I've been having some struggles trying to broadcast again on YouTube. So now YouTube is not accepting any broadcast from my cloud. I have to connect to it directly. And this is why I had to delete the previous link. So if you have shared this video initially before, uh, do us a favor and share the new link to your network, right? So it's going to be an awesome week. It's an awesome show today. So welcome though. Welcome to Behind the Shot. We're live and uh, we're here. And uh, <laughs> Behind the Shot is the show where top visual storytellers like the people I'm, I'm featuring today and the next few days where they share their best fo photos, best videos, best sequences with great stories behind them. We are supported and powered by Deity Microphones. They have been the backbone of this show that's going to six going on six weeks now. Sh sorry. And uh, Deity has been very generous. We they have been giving support in terms of uh, what you call this uh, mics and like lavaliers like uh, D3 Pros and for use for my vlogs and for shows like behind the shot so that's awesome if you are on you on youtube right now please do like this video subscribe and hit that notification bell it goes a long way in supporting behind the shot as you know we do this uh as a sort of um it's on the seat of our pants really and uh we are hoping for more funding for season two but right now everything has been low-key so if you can you know show your love by subscribing and uh, liking this video, it'll go a long way. This video specifically, uh, what we're having right now is the first of our travel and adventure week, right? So we've had different themes for the last few weeks. We had underwater photographers, we had conservation photographers, we had landscape photojournalists, um, wedding photographers. Thing is, because of the lockdown, because of COVID-19, everyone's really just you know, cooped up in their homes. And I know there's a sort of separation anxiety with the outdoors. And what better way to attend to that by teaming up with Grid Magazine and, uh, you know, living vicariously through their photos and the projects that they have done. And if you notice, we have a design change. I changed the background a bit. This is actually one of the photos of our guest today. And I just did an overlay. Yeah, I used to be a graphic designer. And, you know, just to change the feeling of the show just a bit and now we are on our second to the last week you know i i'm not even sure if we're gonna go third uh, another week after that but definitely not we're not gonna exceed or go past the week of june 29 right but it's been awesome it's been great and i think the the break after that will give me time to like you know compare notes with other people see what worked see what didn't and how we can improve this show even more I want to plug something though uh, on Tuesday, uh, sorry on Thursday that is June 18 I'll be appearing naman as a guest in Tito James Deacon's show so if you are online then tune in and see where the Mad Hatter takes me and see how that goes right okay now for today let's go back to today uh, we have our regulars Mabel and Chum here watching the show again uh the show is instructional by nature right so if you have any questions technical questions or just mainly how they work how these guys work please put them in the comments and uh they'll try their best to answer and i'm excited for the guest today because uh he sort of brings us back to underwater that's where i all that's where i started you know the underwater photography that's where my roots are or my reefs are and it's good to see photos and images and we're going to we're going to go through them that goes under the water right again. All right, so my guest today is a photographer, cinematographer, and executive editor at Grid Magazine. You know what? I was supposed to introduce what Grid Magazine is all about, but I let him do that for us. He is a stellar travel, lifestyle, underwater, and documentary photographer. This guy, and I have to say this, this guy is a masterclass in what he does, right? So back in the day, when I would look for pegs, this guy would always pop up. So thank you for your indirect help, Paco. <laughs> so he is also a Sony Alpha ambassador. 
He works with international clients and brands such as, and I've seen these, the Peninsula Hotels, Uniqlo, Aboitis, and World Bank. He studied in Brooks Institute of Photography and holds a degree in Anthropology and Communications from Gold, Goldsmiths College in London. And this Spanish bread, Tito, Spanish bread, not Spanish bread, splits his time in Spain and Manila and possesses an uncanny fami familiarity with feng shui. I'm going to ask you about this, Paco. So, guys, please welcome Francisco Paco Guerrero. What's up, buddy? How are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? I'm going to send you a bill for those pegs, by the way. Um, <laughs> thanks for giving me a heads up. It went a long way, man. I mean, you know. Okay. Yeah. You helped a brother out. So how's everything, man? Good. Grounded. I mean, I'm the least effective travel. All travel photographers are very ineffective these days. We're unable to travel. But right. um, I just like to say before we start that I've been following your show, well, since as early as I, as, as it started. And <laughs> Thank you, it's, buddy. it's been a big deal to, to see the community come together. And I think your platform is a great way to see familiar faces, mm -hmm. um, colleagues in the industry that I maybe haven't had the chance to hang out um, with, right. but you know, through through watching you, I get to have an insight um, about how they work and why they do what they do and how they do it, and it's it's a great thing. So I hope I hope you don't end in June. I hope you continue <laughs> and. I hope that it you know goes goes on further because it's it's a good it's a good part of my week watching this. Thanks, man. Thanks, Paco. Thanks for that. Uh, actually, you know, VJ and I were talking about it. It's just really an excuse for Chismisan, honestly, <laughs> to see how everyone works. <laughs> so you have some fans right now on um, on YouTube. Uh, there oh, I yeah. say, well, I Carmen's here, people. so Carmen is going to be part Hi, of Carmen. the show on Friday and from Sunny. Yeah, I think your show on Wednesday with Sunny and Miguel Nascenzano is going to be quite. A, I'm I'm going to tune in. I mean, I know them both. So I, I think, and Carmen, Carmen is just brilliant. You know, she's she's uh, an inspiration. She's one of the younger photographers and directors we work with, and yeah. she always comes back with amazing stuff. So I think again, thank you for doing a, a grid themed week uh, uh, this week, um, and letting us uh, reminisce on some of the stories we've done. I mean, it's we also miss traveling, so it's it's good to. To make kwentuhan and chismisan. <laughs> Sunny is saying, wow, a shirt with a collar. Yeah, I thought I'd dress up for you. I mean, I saw I saw Jason the other day and he had a tie. But yeah, I, 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 know, never, right? I barely wear ties. So I'm not, you know, I was sure. underdressed for that show. So, okay, Paco, <laughs> tell us about Grid. And, uh, you know, um, I'm going to speak from the layest of layest, layman's, uh, laymen. And uh, what is Grid? How does it? How is it different from the, all the other magazines that we see? Oh, um, we when we started Grid, we we had a little bit of a battle cry. It's a Grid, and and it's on our it's on our Facebook page. Grid is not a travel magazine, and by that we wanted to we wanted to say that we're not the usual travel magazine mm -hmm. because travel for us is just an excuse to really tell the stories about the Philippines. You know, okay. Um, this was started. The idea really started more than five years ago. Um, and it was a conversation between myself and uh, Christine, who's another of the founders. And we realized that as as creatives, um, all the good travel stories we were doing were for foreign magazines, um, not local ones. Okay. Uh, and even then, you know, the Philippines was only covered in a very specific sense. It was always beaches and coconut right. trees and resorts. But we knew, as, as most travelers know, um, the Philippines has a lot more stories than new resorts and beaches and coconut mm. trees, right? True. And we, we thought, you know, we need a platform to talk about these stories. So as, it is, as it's evolved, you'll see our magazine throughout the years. It's, it's about farmers. It's about um, creatives. It's about people trying to build um, a new way of being Filipino through right. travel, right. the travel industry. Right, and you have so, a very unique uh, publishing, uh, like the frequency of, in which at which you you release your your issues. It's not is it monthly? Well, you know when we started this five years ago, publishing print magazine. It's it, you know we weren't rushing into this because we were going to get rich. I can tell you that much. Even five years ago, the print in, the print industry was in a crisis, and we've had to evolve as. Uh, as the print industry has well, well declined. So we started off doing it every two months, so bi-monthly. Um, after that, we've, and it was about 120 pages, what we were publishing. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, we spend up to a week out in the field per story. So we felt that, you know what, 12 pages for a story, it's just not enough. We can't, right. you know, we can't tell the stories we want to tell the way we want to tell them okay. in 12 pages. So we said, let's move to quarterly. We made it 180 pages. Okay. Um, so our stories were running between 18 and 20 pages, uh, which is unique wow. in the magazine industry. Nobody, nobody does 22 page stories, right. but we, our aim was always really the long read format. So you go back to issue one, two, or three, and a lot of the articles that our writers have put together are still relevant today because we never do bucket lists. We never do yeah. you know, the new hotspot you have to visit now because that ages really quickly. As soon as it's published, it's old news. Yeah, that's true. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to do something more long-term, something you can read five, six, seven, eight, ten years from now and get a sense of what Philippine culture and travel is, right. uh, is or was about. And you focus so right on now, people, right? You focus on people primarily. Yeah. Um, travel is about people, man. I mean, yeah. no matter how beautiful the beach or how nice the food, it's still the people you meet along that's the true. way, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what makes it special. So that's always been our battle cry. And um, our covers have been unique. We, you know, nothing against celebrities and, and doing models. And I think that's great. But there's already a very big um, print industry built around that. Okay. Our our cover models are conservationists, um, imams, free divers, farmers. Um, that's that that's what we wanted to do, and and I'm really proud to say that you know I get to work with a team that's accomplished it and is continuing to do it, and that that that's that's really a point of pride for me. Even Sonny and Miguel. Okay. <laughs> Well, maybe. We'll, we'll see what they say on Wednesday. <laughs> All right. So to set the, the tone for us uh, for this week, I'd like to play one of the videos that you released. It's amazing. So Paco, you do photography and then you do cinematography. You do filmmaking and and uh, basically uh, stills. And uh, is this something that you've been doing for a while or did you start with photo and then transition slowly to video? Um. I, like many people a few years ago, found that the camera I was holding wasn't just a stills camera anymore, that it was a full-fledged production video right. camera. So, of course, being curious, I said, well, let, what, let's see what happens when I push the red button <laughs> um, okay. and it starts to roll video. So right. I started to explore that. Um, I mean, when I was in Brooks, we did, we did explore, we had a few, you know, touched a little bit on film and doing, and doing motion. Right. So it was nice to kind of go back to that a bit. Okay. Um, yeah. And what is the, why did you choose to release this video? Like, I think this was a few days ago, no, Paco? What was the motivation behind that? Yeah. Look, I, our creative director, Nachi Ugarte, says that when he's tired of doing work, mm -hmm. he works on stuff for a grid. Ah, so for nice. a lot of us, for at least the partners and the founders, for us, working on grid stuff isn't work. It's really where our passion lies. And right. Having been cooped up, unable to travel for the past, for two months already, I said, well, I'd, I'd really like to touch base with all the grid filmmakers we've gotten to work with over the years. And that was Carmen Del Prado, JC Valencia, um, Laika Gonzalez, Carmen Del Prado, Mike D, Al Cruz. So I said, hey, let's do a Zoom meeting. I have a crazy idea. Why don't, <laughs> why don't we do something? You know, Why don't we do an ode to travel? And of course, right. it all starts with the writing. Yeah. And I told Christine, Christine, how do we put out a video that's that's relevant you know that that speaks to how much travel has helped grow um small economies in the philippines you know the small little resorts in these far-flung islands the banqueros these are the real heroes of travel i think mm -hmm. and they haven't they haven't had a business um in three four months and they might not have a business that's going true. for the rest of the year so this is really a film for about, about them you know about how Travel isn't just about us, the travelers. It isn't just about how much fun we have, that right. we can create a positive impact and that it reaches many, many, many lives and can be a way, uh, as the film says, to rebuild. Cool. Let's check it out. Let's play it. Remember travel? We do. We remember the many amazing places we've seen in our journeys throughout this great country. But more unforgettable were the people that we met. The runners who bring resources to the most remote mountain villages. The marine scientists who guard our seas. 
farmers who toil so that the rest of us will have food to eat, sailors who travel to the Philippines, thousands of islands, so that no one is left behind. We've met artists and scientists, builders and businessmen, advocates and activists, characters and storytellers. They were all working to build a future and to build this country. As travelers, we were also doing our part in keeping people and communities going. We haven't traveled for a while and we feel its absence. We all feel it. Without travel, we've lost a way to connect. But we've realized travel was never a luxury. We remember travel. It brought resources, progress, knowledge, hope. Travel drives economies, fires up imaginations, and brings dreams that will become the realities of the future. And travel will help us rebuild. We will travel again. Beautiful. We have a question here uh, um, from Chum. Uh, nice voice over. Is that your voice, Pajo? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is my voice. Recorded early in the morning with a cup of coffee, hence it's really low and deep. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like the sound of my voice. I, I don't know anybody who does. Um, but yeah, we, we you know we're running on a limited budget here, man. We don't have we, we can't <laughs> go out and hire voiceover actors. So I it fell on to me. Uh, I, I we were doing Zoom meetings with all the direct all the filmmakers, and they they said, yeah, just do it. And I said, well, what if we do you know everybody's voices and like yeah, just just do it. So right there you go. You can I do hope melodrama. You can do mel melodrama, pala. Nice. Oh, oh, can I? Okay, oh, maybe I can do that. While while I'm not traveling, I can do some uh, uh, voiceover uh, work. Latino, Latino teleserie voiceover work. <laughs> Bagay, uh, and people recognized uh, uh, faces there. Uh, Mia Sebastian was there. Uh, yeah, she was actually my classmate in college. Um, oh, yeah, and uh, Tara, Mabel recognized Tara. Tara was uh, the free diver, right? Yeah, Tara's a marine scientist. Tara is a rock and roll marine she scientist. Uh, she's she's one of the best, man. One of these, one of these people that uh, is really out to save the world, and I'm convinced she's gonna she's gonna she's do gonna it. Do but a lot, that. yeah. Ninety percent of the people in this video are people we know. I mean, people we've worked with. You know, know. these aren't these aren't models. These aren't you know. This is all from the last five years of filming. It's so real we people. Wanna, yeah. 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 So Paco, uh, so if this is a lot of clips a lot of footage so what happens when you pick uh, a project you send some guy to do stills and then another to to film is that how you do it yeah look the way the way we do things is uh, a story concept always starts with a writer mm -hmm. um the writer is the one who pitches does a bit of a story outline does the research and then that goes through the editorial process to get approved right. So usually our teams are one writer, one photographer. We never try and have one person do both because mm -hmm. one will suffer. Right. And I think there are really very few people who can do both effectively. Um, and then it, for some stories, for some projects, we do decide to say, okay, this, we should roll video on this. Mm -hmm. So then we'll send uh, one filmmaker with the crew. Okay. Um, as grid, we've done a thing called the grid expedition. Uh, some of the footage you've seen there is from the grid expeditions. Let me just quickly, it's, uh, it was a concept we had um, that started with the Cordillera Conservation Trust. So the idea is to get a small team of grid, a writer, a photographer, a videographer, um, and team up with some sort of conservation um, organization or scientist or researcher. Uh, and then go explore their world with them. And we just, we're just along for the ride, right? right? Um, so Expedition 1 was about the story of J.P. Alipio and the Cordillera Conservation Trust and how their um, battle cry of keep it, keep, keep it wild right. is affecting conservation and tourism up in the north. He's a Nat Geo uh, Explorer, if I'm not mistaken. Nat Geo right? Explorer, yeah. again, another rock star as far as I'm concerned, um, doing important work. Uh, and I think he's a really good communicator. He also has his own podcast now, um, which, which is great because he knows a lot of very interesting people. Uh, so that's a very interesting podcast. 
um, go look for it. JP Alipio's uh, the Wildcast. It's called if the I can Wildcast. Plug it. Love it. The Wildcast. Yeah. Uh, and the second one was about the story of the marine protected area in, in the Philippines. So mm-hmm. that was with Tara, Brina, uh, Rene Abisamis, Rene Hunteriel. And we had got to feature our national scientist, um, Dr. Angel Alcala. Mm-hmm. So basically, this is a story. We all know when we travel, we see the marine protected areas everywhere. Um, Apo Island is one of them. There are a lot of reefs, reefs we go snorkeling in yeah. or diving in and they're MPAs. And this concept was started by a Filipino, by Dr. Angel Alcala. And the, the key, his, the main insight of Expedition 2 is that conservation without considering the community is yeah. useless. Right. Okay. And that, that's what we were trying to drive home. And that was a unique insight that happened uh, here in the Philippines and has been exported to many projects around the world. Right. You know, that's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, it's, it's really nice when you can sort of, you know, if it, ties in conservation travel and community it's always the best uh, you can't have one without the other so I it's agree. all part and parcel of that okay so uh with that let's take the first set of photos as a sort of case study of how grid approaches projects right so uh before i set before you set it up uh you guys if you haven't seen paco's work please visit paco guerrero on instagram amazing stuff the the pegs that I use for my work. <laughs> yeah, it's great. If if you're a photographer looking for pegs, come to my website. It's, it's <laughs> there you <the> perfect go. <laughs> place. <laughs> Royalty free though. And then yeah, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you can also check out my Instagram, the Guevara photo. It is slightly about, a bit about travel, but it's more conservation. So at least you can have a bit of context on who these guys are in front of you right now on your screen. So, all right. So let's head on over to their first photo right here so this is ah. imam right so who is this okay this is imam Eledio, who's a sama or as as most pinoys know it a bajau okay but we found out that apparently bajau is a bit of a derogatory yes term. yes i remember that. so they yeah. don't like uh, being called that and we really should stop using the term bajau the correct term is the sama at okay. least him specifically he's an imam of uh, of the community in Davao, of the okay. community of Sama tribes people in Davao, and they live in an informal settlement in the Davao port, sort of between the industrial cargo port and the passenger terminal. So it's these houses on stilts um, okay. out in the water, and this is a, a very simple portrait of him uh, on Samal Island. It was before we went diving. Really, I said I, I really want to take a portrait of you before we exhaust ourselves in the water. And this uh, eventually became the cover of Grid Magazine, which I believe is the first time Asama Tribesman has been the cover of any magazine in the Amazing. Philippines ever. Um, again, another point we're, we're really we're really proud of. And, and the team was very brave to, to say, hey, yeah, let's go with, with this image. Um, this was our second issue. So this was with writer Christine Funacher and myself. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's the cover. For the for the benefit of those who are watching, uh, we I've met uh, Sama fishermen. Um, actually, the correct probably more colloquially correct term would be spear fishermen. Uh, Paco, maybe you can enlighten them on why they're so famous for what they do. Yeah, the the Sama are part of a larger group uh, that was identified of nomadic ocean going peoples around uh the southern philippines indonesia brunei part of malaysia sulawesi there are there are these water uh water tribes um in in this region the sama just being one uh of the many different groups now they were unique because they lived on floating villages pretty much just sort of moving around different places as weather patterns change as uh, the fish move they moved with so Imagine hunter-gatherers on land that would live in the forests with no mm. permanent um, dwelling. Well, the same for the Sama uh, and the water the water tribes. They're hunter and gatherers, but on the water. Okay. And as, uh, and as such, throughout hundreds of years of existing on the water, literally on the water, some of them wouldn't touch land for months or years at a time. They developed some very unique uh, free diving, what we call free diving techniques. Yeah. So they uh, are masters at holding their breath and spear fishing because that's how they made their living, right? So this uh, this photograph here is a, an, an example of the, the housings they live in now. Unfortunately, modern governments don't like tribes that have no fixed address. They don't like people who cross borders willy-nilly, <laughs> don't pay taxes. 
So a lot of these nomadic tribes, especially in this part of the world, have been forced to settle. And it's a very unnatural thing for them to do. Right. It really class it, clashes with their cultural heritage. So by set, forcibly settling them in fixed uh, locations, there's been a big blow to their cultural heritage and um, their way of life. Right. Uh, but this has been going on for decades. So what we know now is the Sama, or again, uh, is really a reinterpretation of what that culture was. But the culture is about the ocean. The culture is about living off of the ocean. And, and actually, before, before they were marginalized, was a very symbiotic relationship. Uh, okay. Now, some of the Sama are viewed as as a negative, right? Oh, they're the guys who use cyanide. They're the guys who, yeah. you know, use dynamite. Um, they weren't using cyanide and dynamite uh, years ago. This is because they're marginalized and they're hungry and, they, you know, they need to make a living. So, and, and they're competing with commercial fishermen. So, you know. Oh, competing, competing is a very optimistic <laughs> word, Noel. <laughs> they're, That's true. They're being decimated by commercial fishermen, you know. Yeah. Um, but again, we're discovering uh, there, there's a there's a growing uh, spearfishing community in the Philippines uh, yeah. uh, as a recreational sport, and it is when done right, it is a very sustainable way um, right. and a very selective way to to fish. Yeah, actually, yeah, there there is a stigma about spear, spear fishermen that uh, they say that uh, well, uh, they are not as disciplined as you know your run of the mill commercial fishers. But actually, it is one of the mo- the better way, the more sustainable ways to to fish because you can fish and you know, what you what you shoot or what you get and what you hunt and that's what you eat right so that's usually what what happens there's no waste and there's no um, overfishing that happens there we have a question here Paco from uh, Mabel is um, let me cue that up uh, I've always wanted to do an immersion travel trip with Sama drivers huh. and die with them is that possible you know that's a good question uh, I'm not sure if it, it's a, it's something that's being organized now, but you know, we were introduced, uh, or Christine was introduced to, to the Imam and the Sama through a free diver named Wolfgang Daffert. Mm, now he's right. an Austrian record holding free diver. And this is him. This is him. This okay. is his profile. Um, so he's as a professional free diver, he became interested in the indigenous knowledge, shall we say. So okay. he spent some time in Thailand, for example, where he discovered a, tri- a, a group of native uh, tri- a tribal people there who he found could control the curvature of their eyes to be able to see better underwater. What? So really? they would physically voluntarily yeah, the muscle, voluntarily they would physically distort the curvature of the cornea or part of I'm not a doctor wow. the cornea or part of their eye to focus underwater. And this is something that they developed through centuries, right? Right. So after spending some time with them, he said he, he heard about the, the Sama and said, yeah. I want to I explore. And Wolfgang discovered, uh, again, for the non, non-technical non here, that he discovered a way of uh, that the Sama do, which is called wet equalization. You know, when you dive or you, you're snorkeling mm-hmm. and your ears get stuck and you do this, yeah. right? You're blowing air into your cavities to equalize the right. pressure. Yes. Well, the Sama are going down to such depth that doing this with 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 your with your nose isn't a very effective yeah. method. So they do a uh, a method that uh, Wolfgang calls wet equalization. Wet. Okay. They they purposefully inhale water into their nasal cavities, and again through either the muscles or the pressure in their face, they're able to move the water around their sinus cavities. Okay. Um, to wow. equalize the pressure outside. Um, what, what he discovered, I think, ultimately, is that the problem with that is that it does cause ear more infections, sinus infections, yeah. ear infections. There were a lot of blown eardrums. Foreign particles, but you know, also, yeah. ultimately, what Wolfgang was after is that you know, free diving. Although right now it's the the top Instagram sort of <laughs> thing to do, long fin suit. Yeah. I love my free divers. Uh, this has been done by peoples around the world for, for hundreds of years, yeah, yeah. and they, they have knowledge. That, that could be very useful to understand how the human body reacts at depth. You know, uh, if I'm not mistaken, so I went to Samal, actually, Samal, Samal, Samal Island, I can't remember. Samal, yeah. Samal, Samal Island, Island. Yeah. yeah. I went there in 2017 with Studio H2O to shoot a documentary. I think, was that the, mm. the same time that you were shooting this project? Um, Around 2017? I, I, no, we were earlier. We were earlier. around 2015, okay. 2016, yeah, if, okay. I'm, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So we went there, and then they were telling me. So I had the, 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 the great uh, 
opportunity to actually die with some of them. But I was, of course, with the tank and Guillaume Neri. And uh, they were telling me that Imam could dive down to 100 meters. Is that correct? Huh. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I, 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 I did. Mean, one on say, one I, breath, guys. That just, yeah, yeah. You know, one one breath. Yeah. For the uninitiated, free diving is just with one breath, and you go down hundred meters. That 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 is a that's really deep. You know, one of the things Wolfgang discovered was that nobody had really taken the time to measure how deep these guys goes uh, go. Because really? you know, these guys don't have don't have dive watches and depth yeah. gauges. They just go. Yeah. So the competition, an informal competition. Um, and the prize was a big sack of rice. So he said, hey, okay. just, guys, come and let, just go as deep as you want to go. And they were just informally, without really taking it too seriously, they were going 60, 70 meters, right. um, which is a two-minute, sometimes three-minute breath hold. And that wasn't, that wasn't a big deal for them. They weren't really pushing it. You know, They were just kind of playing around. So I think these guys, these guys are capable of going of going deep. I mean, the the, rec the world record right now by a professional freediver is hovering just past 100 meters. So it, it it would be amazing to see one of these guys, you know, equal yeah. that depth. And then they, now they they compete, right? Also, they're they've been included in yeah. the community in the freediving community. You know, we really want to reach out with the magazine and try and, and make as much of a difference as we can. And maybe we did a little bit. I'm not claiming that we're responsible, but but you know I think hopefully it did. And, and you know the Imam story has been great. He's been featured on HBO. You did a you included him in a documentary with Guillaume Neri. Um, he's going to be in a documentary on Netflix soon. And now he's uh, he's part of the free diving community. He uh, attends competitions. You know the mm. community has been able to raise some funds, get him enough uh, funds to get to the hall and training and. Um, so it's it's good to see that that um, he's been able to join a lot of the competitions and share his knowledge as well with the other uh, younger free divers. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Who is this guy in the photo right now? That guy is nuts, man. That guy. That guy is named Papa Kula. He's sort of the Imam sidekick. You know, okay. for every Batman, there's a Robin, <laughs> and this guy was definitely the Robin. So what he's holding uh, is a lure. Uh, a lure. Okay. It, it's a lure, which uh, back in the day when you were allowed to hunt sharks and 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 the bigger fish, um, they dragged this behind a, a banca, a small boat. Um, so there'd be two bancas parallel. The one on the right would have this bait, and then Popokula would be on the left one, also holding on a, on a rope, being dragged with a spear gun. So he'd basically just look right and wait for a big shark or something huge to come up for this bait and shoot it. Wow, that's what he'd do. Um, of course, they don't do that now because you can't eat, well, you can't hunt sharks. You're not supposed to hunt sharks. But um, this guy was a character. This guy was a real character. And then uh, this is Imam. Uh, this is his family. Yep, this is Imam's family. His wife and his and his kids. Uh, they live here over the water. Mm -hmm. um, and he's called the Imam because he is the Imam. He's the Imam uh, of the local mosque. Okay. So a lot of a lot of the Sama of the Sama people have um, taken Islam as as their religion. So again, that's that's a modernization of their culture, right. uh, and that that's that's how he makes his living. You know, he spearfishes in the morning, and uh -huh. then he does prayers uh, in the afternoon. Uh -huh. um, and he's he's a great, he's a well loved part of the community, I believe. You know, it's interesting in this photo, Paco, are the fins that they're using, and it's only one on one on one foot, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the basic equipment they use, and, and I think there's a couple of photographs later sure. uh, you'll see more in detail. Yeah, it's, it's one fin, one foot. Um, they have a mask, which they kind of jerry-rig. Usually it's the old traditional goggles, and they have a homemade spear gun. And then they have a weight, the babit. So to descend, yeah. instead of having to fin down, they yeah. just hold on to, yeah, this is the mask, and that's the fin. And on the left here is the babit. Okay. So it's just a piece of iron, really, yeah. that they hold on to that allows them to drop down to depths a lot quicker. Then that's pulled up by someone on the boat, and, and they wait for them to come up. And the spear guns are, are hand-carved. There's nothing nothing modern, modern right. about it. Okay. Yeah. Now, I think uh, this would be a good time to ask you, Paco. So when you approach this story, uh, and this is for those who want to try their hand on, I guess, documentary or travel photography, how do you differentiate the subject from your story? Oh, 
that's an interesting question. How do you differentiate your subject from your story? Because sometimes, I'm, I'm sure, like for this one, the imam was your subject. But I think after looking through your photos, right, this is a spectacular masterclass of a, of a photo essay. The story is bigger than that. So, yeah. you mm. know, I want to pick your brain. And because uh, it usually when you're asked to do something, right, you, you go and uh, you, I want you to photograph imam. That's your assignment. And then you get there. Oh, you don't know the story is bigger. Than just Ibam, he figures in it or something. But how do you how do you approach it? I'll tell you a secret: the story is always bigger than what you think it is. I mean, that's why you go. Yeah. Right? Uh, the way we do it at Grid is we we don't use the word peg. Okay. Because for us, peg, at least in the way we do things, peg limits your vision of the world. All of a sudden, you're looking at, okay, I need to find this image because it's my peg. Instead of really looking around you and saying, well, what, what's here? What what is the story? Right. Because there's no way there's no way we can write a storyboard for this sitting in Manila without having gone to, to walk the, the planks of the village to go into the water with him. So what we do is what during story development and the writer takes lead here always. It, it's just a general outline. Yeah. We try and talk to the people. We try and make contact, but we just want to get a rough idea of what we might find. So we're never there to prove ourselves right. Mm -hmm. We're always there to try and find a story. Right. Does that does that make sense as far as it does? As it does. So now structure? on the opposite extreme is what if you went there and you had something in mind already, but by the end of that, let's say that three day or nine day trip, you know what? The story's different. And it's uh, always like that. Okay. It's always like that. And luckily the way we do it is when a photographer and the writer come back, we allow time. Uh, and creative discussion for them to tell us what the story they found is. Because right. we know, uh, as you know, the editors know, the photo editor, Sunny knows that it's never what you send them out to shoot. True. The story really is what they come back with. And you have to be flexible enough to allow for that difference. Mm -hmm. right? As editors sitting in Manila, we're not there to force what the story is. Yeah. We're there to listen, okay, what was the story you found and how can we tell that in the best possible way? Mm -hmm. Right. So again, here the story was the imam, but really it's about conservation, it's about culture, yeah. it's about the sama, it's about marginalization, it's about freedom. Right. Yeah, that's so three pillars coming together: your community, your conservation, and your travel. So yeah, that's exactly. What the grid is all about man. Cool. Uh, so for you guys who are watching, we just uh, finished the first uh, photo set uh, with Paco Guerrero. And please check out his Instagram, my, my source of pegs. So uh, Studio Guerrero, <laughs> I have collected it. Initially, it was saying Paco Guerrero. So the wonders of uh, technology, Paco, I was able to fix it while you were, you know, talking and giving your... Uh, you're here, you're, like, you're a one-man band, band, man. You're editing, you're hosting. It's amazing what you're doing. It's amazing. It's amateur hour. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Before we move further, I'm sure there are people who are curious as to what gear you use or what you bring. Uh what cameras, what lenses, what other stuff that you, Lucky Charms, that you bring in your in your shoots? <laughs> right. Um, well, I'm a Sony. I'm a Sony ambassador. I've been a Sony ambassador for three years now, going on four. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily enough, they have a they have a quiver of lenses and cameras that covers the gamut. Right. So, but I try and travel with only stuff I can carry on my back because usually okay. this great assignments is you're you're alone. You don't have a big crew. So I'm traveling usually with a couple of the A7s, the A7-2Rs or the A7-4R, and those are my uh, stills workhorses. Mm -hmm. And then I'll use, I always travel with at least two bodies, always travel with a backup. Okay. Um, that's super important. Lens-wise, I go from the 16-35, the 50, uh, the 35 uh, Prime has become a real favorite. I will rarely bring the 80 to 200. Because I'm not a long lens shooter. I'm not like Jilson, who's a master of that, yeah, that lens. No, Jilson's that, a real yeah, wow. He really it's amazing. He I'll bring it. it. I'll bring it only if I know I'm gonna need it. But it, that's right. another great lens. Um, and then the underwater housings. I have two. I have a Sony underwater housing, which is really small, which fits the RX100, and that's great because if a if a shoot isn't necessarily full underwater shooting, mm -hmm. I don't want to have to walk around with a huge underwater yeah, housing true. for nine days. So I have a small option that I can just put in the bag and, and pull out when I need it. Okay. Then, of course, there's the big Icolite underwater housing, which right. fits the Sony A7 series. For the more For serious. More serious stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you bring, uh, do you bring um, artificial lights? Do you bring soft boxes uh, when you travel? 
Um, for the grid style stories, no. Okay. Because um, we're really trying to move fast. We're really trying to make as little an impact as possible. Mm -hmm. And the style of images that grid does is um, a lot closer. You know, we don't want to really make our subjects too exotic. Right. Which sometimes uh, the addition of artificial light or a softbox, and I've done it. I, I, I do it a lot, actually. Um, sometimes it it removes them a little bit mm -hmm. from their reality right. and makes them more of a subject rather than a person. Okay. But for, your prof but for your professional work, like for, let's say, uh, Uniqlo or Peninsula, you use softboxes for your staff. A ton of them. Um, a ton of them. We travel with uh, between 50 and 100 kilos of gear, and wow. the team goes from anywhere from two to four to six. Right. Um, and if it's a big TVC, then it's like 100 or so. But I think I think the message is um, flexibility, that you don't have to bring everything all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the reason I have maybe oh God, I have maybe 20 bags. Because depending on, on the style of assignment, you, I know you have a lot of bags. I can see it behind <laughs> you. Depending yeah. on the style of assignment you do, you want to make sure you bring just enough. You, know, right. you don't want to be bogged down by too much gear. And yes, and sometimes I would have to say that uh, it's more liberating to just travel, let's say, with just one lens rather than you know having a, a quiver, as you say, of yeah. lenses. All right, so let's uh, move on to this video. Oh. This was shot yeah, this at the same time? This, this was one of the first video attempts we did on, on a grid assignment. That's Wolfgang. So this was on a GoPro. I mean, a mm -hmm. GoPro okay. 3 or 2. Uh, I mean, really, I was just messing around, really, to say, hey, what, what can we do with this thing? We're trying to experiment. Um, so this is a very a very amateurish uh, GoPro-style attempt at documenting what we were oh, trying to do. Oh, there's a softbox. There's a softbox there. But again, we didn't end up using those images. Um, <laughs> again, this is issue 2. So the, the team, the team and I at Grid, we were still exploring what our voice was and what our visual language was. You know, we, we were still feeling it out, right? Wow, we have exactly the same shot, man. Yeah. In my document. <laughs> yeah. Great minds. Yeah. Pegs. I actually <laughs> I, I actually got I actually got the bends a mild case of the bends really? here because we got out there. Yeah, we got out there and I I'd forgotten my weight belt. So I was stuck, you know, I was shooting at the time with an, you know what an Iwa Marine is? It's a glorified plastic bag where you put your camera in and then okay. the high heavens that it doesn't flood. So it's basically a big air balloon with a camera inside. Uh, so the problem, I couldn't go down because it was so buoyant. So I was saying, okay, I can go down maybe five meters and up, five meters and up. Right. And after a whole tank of doing that, I, I was doubled over for the rest of the day, of which is a, a lesson I learned. Um, it wasn't it wasn't anything severe or hospitalization, but right. I was I was I was hurting for a good day after doing that. <laughs> we have a we have a question in a comment here. Um, okay, from Mabel again. Oh, Ale Ponzo is uh, tuned in. Um, Mabel, it's interesting to still see people who know how to actually hunt and not rely on uh, commercial food. And then for the shoot with the spearfishers, I think you answered it. Was it shot on one breath as well, or were you with a tank? I, I I was with a tank then. This was this was before I had contact with with free diving. So okay. I had no experience free diving whatsoever, and I thought uh, the tank would be would be the way to go because that's how I knew how to be in the water as, as a scuba diver. Um, and Sunny here, I'm seeing is correcting me already. I know, I know. Yeah. You're a troll. You have a <laughs> you have a paid troll. We used. <laughs> oh, he's a photo editor. It's a job. <laughs> we used one photo where you used the softbox for Phil. I checked. Ha. Huh. Okay. Right, but. Um, it's not something. It's not something I like to do much now when we shoot grid stories. And it's just fill. It's not overpowering. Yeah. It's not sort of a softbox as key light um, effect, right? That's true. There you go, Sunny. That there's your answer. Hey, I'm a, I'm accountable to my photo editor. <laughs> Which, by the way, for the listeners, when we say Sunny is our photo editor, I, I found that in in here in the Philippines, photo editor is uh, when people use the term photo editor, they mean someone who does the retouching and photo manipulator. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we say photo editor, Sonny is in charge of coordinating all assignments with the photographers. He's in charge of reviewing all the images when they come in and selecting or editing the, the, the visual part of the story. Um, and then handing that over 
to the art director who then lays it out and, and puts the words and the pictures together, right? I have a term for it, but it's PG. I can't use it here. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> for our episode, Sunny, don't worry. Okay. So, and then the, the, the second set is closely related to the first. So we had your yeah. cultural dri- diver, your, your Sama uh, Spear Fisherman. Then for this one, you have your free divers, right? And you free dive as well, right? Yeah, well, after, after getting sick with, a, with an air tank trying to photograph the imam, I said, okay, I'm, I got I to gotta learn how to do this. Luckily, right. I was able to take a very short course with Wolfgang and then eventually the wonderful, fantastic Tara Abrina. And Carlo Navarro um, mm-hmm. safely guided me through my Ida two certification. So, so yeah, I'm a very, very humble, very bad free Right. Ida. <laughs> Tara is awesome. You know, uh, with my certification for Ida two, she was the one who got me to 16 meters. So I was really having problems going down 16 meters. There was that, you know, there's there's tension and there's fear, but mm-hmm. you know, she, you know, she was my wingman for that. So that was wing woman for that. That was awesome. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, tell us more about this project that you have for Grid. Okay, so um, this, so we we had contact already with the free diving community in the Philippines with mm-hmm. that with that um, issue two story, which was back in 2015, mm-hmm. before there was a free diving community really to speak of, um, and Wolfgang and a lot of other people featured in the story were part of creating that culture. One of the key people was Carlo Navarro. Who's, uh, who does mano mano free diving out of Anilao. And I think he's been responsible for training a lot of our instructors now, and a lot of free divers go through him. Mm-hmm. So he's been key. So this was done two years ago, and the idea was a follow up story and say, hey, okay. you know, the first, the, the first free diver we put on the cover was an imam from Davao. And yeah. uh, four years later, all of a sudden, free diving is uh, experiencing an incredible growth in the Philippines. And we think it, it's one of the perfect um, activities uh, for travelers in the Philippines. You know, it doesn't have the financial barrier of entry that scuba does, because yeah. scuba can get expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it allows us to enjoy our coastlines. And, you know, it's a skill that very, very many people can do. It, it's with a little bit of practice and the right instruction, almost anybody can do it. Yeah. And at the same time, we were seeing that Bohol was becoming an epicenter regionally and globally for the freediving community. Professional freedivers were choosing the Philippines to come and train for competitions. And the project you were involved in with Guillaume Neri, who arguably is the most famous freediver right now, yeah. um, he did this great project in the Philippines and the DOT decided to name us uh, the freediving uh, capital of Asia, right? Really? Um, so basically, yeah. yeah I, well, I we remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We we have the we have the spots. Basically, a free diver is looking for calm water, calm and very very deep water, as close to shore as possible. Mm-hmm. And we have that, especially in Panglao, um, yeah. and in a lot of spots around around the Visayas. There's a lot of potential. So okay. the idea here was to really say, okay, this is a new sport. This is a radical sport. It's getting a lot of traction. Um, it's a new way to interact with nature. Mm-hmm. So let's do a story about, you know, how this evolved. And the writer for this was Froline, um, Froline Econar. It was her okay. first time free diving. Um, and for me, the most amazing thing was, I, you know, this is, uh, this is Stefan Randi, who's, uh, I mean, he's a national, 16-time national record holder. And you get to share the water with them, you know. I mean, they were, they were, pandering to my free diving level okay let's see <laughs> be clear we weren't down 50 meters for these shots there's no way so they were you know they were the really training nice wheels enough. were on <laughs> yeah absolutely um so they were really nice enough to, yeah, to free dive at my level which is very yeah. shallow but um to share the water with these guys is, is amazing again free diving is a great example of what grid really is about you know number one um it's about con- it's about conservation because these right. guys want clean oceans. These guys are going to be throwing plastic, and you know they want the ocean to be clean. Uh-huh. Uh, it's about travel because you get to go to all these destinations, um, and it's about this community of of, of breath holders, right? right that, that's being built around around the Philippines. And how does that affect travel? Well, now all of a sudden you have um, far flung destinations that couldn't afford to develop a dive resort or have the facilities for a a, a dive shop. 
because mm-hmm. that involves a lot of money. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, with some safety equipment and a well-trained instructor team, you could open up free diving in a small yeah. little village in Palawan or in the right, Visayas. Right. Right? So it had that potential. That's um, true. Still has that potential. But certification, though, is important. I have to say that uh, there are Absolutely. some right, the pop-ups that aren't certified. So be careful. In as much as uh, Paco and I are encouraging you to take a free diving, uh, my brother-in-law, uh, Nico Soriano, is also a free diver and uh, an underwater photographer. He set up shop also, C-Zoned, in, uh, in Coron mm. and also yes. here in Manila. So, But of course, because of what's happening... Uh, they're they're having some challenges. Now, uh, one thing I want to share with everyone is uh, a lot. Uh, most of the people I encounter are very hesitant to take a free diving, mainly because they have this notion that I can't hold my breath for two minutes. And I remember Carlo saying specific, uh, very specifically, that uh, anyone and everyone with the proper training can at least get to two minutes of uh, breath hold, right? And it does have advantages as well right because for me as a wildlife photographer with less bubbles i can get closer mm-hmm. to and to bigger animals oh so nico is watching so hi nico nico soriano so he's an incredible photographer as well he has you know follow him on instagram but he does his work also in Quran. and it's amazing um Paco, that we have so many spots here that are great for free diving Right. Yeah, um, and it, it, I'm glad to see like the DOT is, is recognizing that potential, yeah, right? right? But as you said, um, this can be a dangerous thing to do if mm-hmm. done in ignorance, like anything, like right. going trekking on the mountains, right? So do get certified by a proper certifying body, whether it be Ida, Paddy, Molchanovs, whatever it might yeah. be, but go through the training. Yes. It's a great way to experience our, our country, really. Um, most of our country is underwater, so <laughs> if you want to go it see is. it. That's true. Uh, Mabel is asking for a free diver, photographer, videographer week, please, for behind the shot. Sure, for season two, we're going to have that. Um, first, definitely, absolutely, we're going to have that. Okay, so in um, on Facebook, actually, my friend Paolo Francesco said that uh, I really love their work, Grid's work on the Pearl Farmers. I, he reread that article so many times. And coincidentally, that is our third set. So oh, good. Awesome. Right. So when did you shoot this uh, project, Paco? Oh, you got me there. No, this was done in 2017, I believe. 2016, 2017. Okay. <laughs> um, now, this is the story really of a company called Jewelmer. Okay. Um, and for those who don't know, they farm the Golden South Sea Pearl, which, by the way, is also our national gem, mm, uh, which is on the 1,000 peso bill. Okay. Uh, and it's the only precious gem that's grown and not mined. Okay. Right. So it's the only really sustainable gem in the world. Okay. Uh, it has to be cultivated. The catch, um, the golden type, the golden variety um, is very, very hard to find. It's very rare, uh, usually only found in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jewelmer was able to breed the oysters um, that produce the golden South Sea pearl. Okay. And the oyster is very picky, man. It only will grow in pristine water. It doesn't like, you know, plastic cups with crabs in it floating around, man. I can tell you <laughs> that much. So it only likes clean, clean, clean water. Right. Um, the founder of Jumer actually was the one who started, um, Mr. Brunick was started the black pearl industry in Tahiti. Um, and from there, he took some of the, the, the information and the knowledge he had from starting the black pearls there to the golden South Sea pearls here. Okay. And now Jewelmer is the number one uh, golden South Sea pearl farmer wow. and jeweler in the in the world. Amazing. So you were saying though before uh, <laughs> in your notes that this was a failed cover shot. Yeah, this was. <laughs> uh, the joke, the joke, the joke is uh, all my cover shots are outtakes. Um, like the ones I purposefully try and make a cover, don't make it. And Sunny will go find I was gonna say. <laughs> shot at the back of the SD card. No, that's the cover. Damn it. Um, okay. But yeah, this was, was a, yeah, this was a, this was a failed cover try up on my end. His, this guy's name is Sano. He's okay. in one of the Jewelmer uh, farms. And the Jewelmer farms are in Palawan, um, undisclosed locations. They're, they keep quiet where these exact locations are for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and the great thing about this is that, uh, you know, it really was about the community. 
because dual merit to be able to create these pearls, these pearls take five years before you can get a pearl. Okay. All right. It's not something you you go into within two months. Okay, I got a pearl. The yeah. cheap sort of Viet, uh, ones from Vietnam and China. What's inside the pearl is is a very big plastic bowl, and within months they can get that covered with lacquer. That's why it's so cheap because it's mostly plastic. These, these aren't that. You know, these take five years to grow. So these are very isolated islands um, in Palawan, and the secret that Julmer has figured out and that's why they're successful, is because the pearl for them is a secondary product. Mm -hmm. The first goal really is to build a community. So you have to have these farmers and, and the farm workers become a little village. Um, and they take these people from all over the Philippines. They create these little villages on these isolated islands. Right. And and Jack Brennelik, who, who, who runs Jewel Murnau, the son of the founder, uh, was saying that, you know, if you notice it, if there is conflict, in the farm, like some people are fighting, there isn't very good vibes. The production of the pearl goes down. If the farm is really gelling really well and people are happy and working and working well, the production goes up. So he 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 says that you know whenever you touch the oyster, it absorbs your energy. Mm -hmm. So if you're angry, if you're tired, if you're not doing well, you know that pearl will absorb that energy and it won't grow. Wow. So it's a whole holistic approach they have. And, and yeah. all, the, all the pearl farms, all the waters where the pearl farms are, are marine protected areas. Okay. Um, so they're not only there to protect the, the oysters, they're there to protect the environment. So they have a long view because they know it's useless for them to protect just the oysters if the water is getting polluted, if right. there's cyanide fishing just a few hundred yards away. So okay. again, for them, it was creating a community. And that was a big discovery for us as far as uh, this story. We spent nine days north to wow. south of Palawan for this, visiting over seven farms. Um, it was an epic thing. At one point, we had no signal for maybe three or four days and our respective spouses, uh, the writer <laughs> and I, were calling each other. Hey, have you heard from Paco? Have you heard from, you know, and we had to give signs of life every once in a while. <laughs> wow. Um, you, you, get one the, of, you get the best assignments, I agree there, I have to say I, I try. The rumor is that if there's a if there's a nice resort, then I'll do it. Um, right. If it's trekking up a mountain and staying in a tent, that's Sunny and Miguel will, <laughs> will be handling that that story. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so from Sunny, this became the story cover. It was a diptych yeah. with the gold pearls on the left page and this on the right. The issue cover that's was right. underwater shot black and white. I love how you have a wingman yeah. in the comments, man. Awesome. Well, you'd say wingman. I'd say someone who you know keeps Patron. me to high standards. You know, I better be careful what I say here. You know, um, you're on the uh, this, this, okay. this this picture I love. You know, the seat. What at the beginning, Julmer would would collect the oysters wild, um, but okay. they knew that that was not sustainable. That was that there was already pearl farming down south in Mindanao, mm -hmm. right? But more than farming, was pearl collecting really. So what they figured out is that they had to learn how to breed these oysters properly. Okay. And the species of oysters they use is called the pintada maxima. Pintada but they maxima. couldn't breed it until they figured out what it ate. And just imagine that out of 40,000 species of plankton, they figured out about half a dozen that these oysters eat. And this is what you see here. They're growing the plankton. They're growing they the feed. plankton. Okay. They're growing very specific species of plankton that they use to feed um, the baby oysters. So it, it's an incredible story. Wow. If you can, it's available online, I believe. I have to check with digital. But it's an incredible <laughs> story of overcoming these impossible odds, you know, and becoming this fantastic thing. It has become a science. Huh? Wow. Okay. And then, why is this guy with shades and a? Is that a yeah, shirt this. <laughs> um, you know these these pearl farmers spend hours out in the open under the sun in the in the middle of the ocean. Okay. So you know skin cancer. So they've come up with really creative <laughs> uh, and funny ways to cover. You know, it's not just a face mask. It's never boring with them. They're they're being very very creative about. Um, how they cover themselves up. Right. I, I, there's a whole collection of these portraits. When they come in at the end of the day, all covered with all sorts of stockings and just <laughs> was a bit of a show. That's yeah, interesting. And uh, this is a technician or is this... Um... Oh, yeah, it is. It's a okay. Technician. Okay, me... go ahead. My son is here. 
you might see them come out from behind me. They're all okay. trapped. This is my temporary <laughs> office. Now, the grafting. So, and you know, another interesting thing about pearl farming is that the Japanese uh, were the ones who really developed the technology of grafting, which is when you open the, the oyster, you insert mm -hmm. a, a specific type of material, which I won't name, around which the pearl forms. Right. Right, because remember, the pearl is like a gallstone. It's the oyster trying to get rid of excess minerals. Right. That's what it is. So the Japanese developed a technology where they insert a specific material into a part of the oyster, and that becomes the seed. They call it the seed where uh, the pearl will form. Okay. And for the longest time, the Japanese withheld that technology, and it was, it was prohibited for any Japanese technician to teach that to anybody else anywhere in the world. Okay. And this only changed, I believe it was in the 60s or 70s, where very slowly there was a trust developed and the Japanese um, technicians then started to train. So uh, there are a couple of Japanese technicians still with Joomer, but a lot of them now are Filipino. So second, third generation grafters wow. um, who are the ones uh, continuing the process. Wow, this is so interesting. Yeah, uh, if you can, you know, the great thing about Joomer is that uh, they have a resort called mm. Flower Island which is sort of smack dab in the middle of some of their pearl farms. Right. And you can go there, you can stay. It's a fantastic resort, which is why I accepted the assignment. <laughs> um, fantastic resort, great people, super friendly. Right. And you get to do a tour of the pearl farm. So you can actually see a lot of the photographs you're seeing here. You can see some of these things. Uh, you can see the plankton lab, you can see right. the hatch lab. Oh, so it's open see... to, to anyone who, who's interested. Yeah, yeah, it's, to, it's, to open, it's open to anyone, man. Um, and I think I'd like to see more Filipinos really, really getting to know what this is because it's, it's a fantastic thing. It really right. is. Right. Okay. And then uh, I'm actually waiting for your sons to come out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. For you guys who are watching, this is Behind the Shot where top visual storytellers share their best photos, videos, and whatever they have with great stories behind them. So we just went through three with uh, Paco Guerrero. Check him out on Instagram, Studio Guerrero. Do you have a YouTube account or a Vimeo? should plug it in. I have a, uh, yeah. Uh, well, actually, my website's the best place to go to. So www.francisco-guerrero.com is the best place to find me which um, by the way i just access. i just checked out with uh i was looking for an about and i couldn't find any the man is a mystery yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know if you press the email click uh, the email tab you'll, you'll get some there you go information on on <laughs> who i am okay so we are down to our last uh set of photos now this is was actually a personal request from my end why mm. because again uh i would like to exp uh, take the time out to explain this Initially, we just wanted three photos, mainly from Grid. But Paco posted a set of photos uh, from a personal trip in Spain. And what I noticed about it and what he confirmed in his caption was that he was only using primarily one lens, right? And I am a big fan of, uh, of that. You know, when you just you, you, uh, simplify your gear and you're a minimalist photographer, you go around and uh, you just have one lens. And the thing is... It is a frightening thought to just go out on a trip, right? <laughs> Especially if you're going to Spain yeah. and you just have one focal length. One, what was yeah. what was the lens you were using, Paco? Uh, well, it's not just for personal trips. You know, a lot of the images you you showed are shot on my my go-to lens, which is the fifty millimeter. Um, with the Sony, it's the it's the fifty-five millimeter. Okay. Um, but I I've always shot maybe it's safe to say eighty percent of my travel work is done on that lens. Fantastic. Okay. The so, most beat up lens I own. <laughs> so Paco, let's put our professor caps on, and for the benefit okay. of those who hear, all these guys here probably definitely travel a lot, and uh, the usual question is, what kind of lens will I bring now? Let's go. This is usually an exercise or a challenge, you know, Paco. When you read those how you know how tos or travel photography, there's one chapter there. Yeah. Try to travel with just one lens. So, describe to us uh, what went through your mind in traveling with just one lens. So, and it's and it's fantastic. Sorry, let me correct that. Uh, that was squished. I know OBS is messing up. So just give me a preamble first while I fix that. Yeah. Well, um, you, you know. Each lens is really a unique way of seeing the world, right? right? So while you can buy, you can have a huge quiver of lenses, and I sure do, I have to admit, and I said it earlier, that Jilson is the master of the 80 to 200 or the 100 right. to 400. 
I really believe that you have to learn how to see in specific focal lengths. Okay. You don't become a good photographer by switching lenses. You become a good photographer by mastering lenses, I think. So the way you see the world on a 24, a 50, a 100, a 16 is very different. Yeah. And you need to invest time in mastering each lens. So um, I, I did this when I was starting as a photographer because I couldn't afford to buy anything else. I only had a 50. That's all I could afford with my little film, you know, Canon F1 camera. Yeah. Um, so that's how I, that's, that's why it's my, it's my, it's my favorite lens because it's right. the one I've been using the longest and it's right. the one I'm most familiar with. Okay. And I'm not saying everybody go out and buy a 50 and it's the best lens. It's the best lens for me. And I think as photographers, we should invest time in mastering a lens. Yeah. So the best time to do that is when you're, you have no pressure. You don't have Sunny Tapura who's going to be looking <laughs> at your pictures when you come back and going, hey, where's the, you know, where's the wide shot? Where's the close up? So what I, I, I still do it when I walk around and I do street photography or like this one, I, when I go on vacation, I'll just put one lens and I'll force myself to really just work with that one lens. So you just literally brought one lens for this trip or you just used I, one lens? No, no. I brought one lens. I brought the, the Sony a7 III, which is a great little camera. You know, it's not the megapixel beast of the R of the R4, right. but dude, the, the, the a7 III is just fantastic. Um, and I brought the 55. That's it. Honestly, nice. um, I didn't want to carry anything else, to be honest. <laughs> I was on vacation. I didn't want to have another bag for cameras. I really didn't. That's amazing. Um, okay. So how did you? So it you didn't experience that sort of fear, no? So I'm I'm sure people are watching like, what we have to, br we're gonna try and bring just one lens. I can't imagine, you know, what if suddenly I went to a church and I wanted to, you know, get the ceiling, but then I only have a 55. So how does that work with you? You don't have a wide shot. <laughs> you just have to live with it. Look, is what it is. This 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 image here, um, just to give an intro. This is my 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 father and my mom and the two young gentlemen behind them, who you might see behind me if they have to go out <laughs> of their rooms, are my sons. Now, this is the bench, the exact bench in the Retiro Park um, in Madrid, where my father proposed to my mother, uh, well, how long am I? 46 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and my dad and my mom know where that bench is, because right beside it is a, a famous little bar where you can have churros and chocolate, right. and, and right. it's that exact bench. So whenever we're in Spain, we tr we do a, a a next version. You know, this is the second time we're able to do it with the grandkids and the grandparents. Okay. Um, and the first time I did was shot on the fifty because on that trip I also only brought the the fifty five. That's all I brought. Wow. Okay. And to answer your question, go. <laughs> no, no, go for it. Go for it. Uh, you know, the thing with the fifty five. Oh, I need a wide. I need a tight. Um, move your position. Uh, to. Uh, we know with the with the variable focal lenses or the zoom lenses, I get lazy and I just kind of, yeah. you know, twist the ring. I've got a wide, I've got a tight. Uh, uh, it's always better to pick up your feet and move around your subject. Then yeah. you get really good coverage of your subject. Right. Um, and having a fixed lens and only one of them yeah. will really force you to do that. And if you can learn that skill, you'll find that you're discovering images within that situation that you wouldn't have, even if you had 50 lenses with you. Okay. Because so, you didn't move. So Sonny is saying that um, in response to that, Carmen in the 85. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Carmen, yeah, and yeah. she's saying that uh, she loves the 55 millimeter too. So, no, yeah. no, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna, no. No, Carmen, even when we shoot video and Carmen's part of my team, I try to make sure to give her the 85. Because I know she sees the world through that lens. Through that lens, She's yeah. really good at the 85. So she does stuff I'd never imagined. Okay, so Paco, by extension, do you force yourself to see through other focal lengths also, like a, as a sort of challenge or as an yeah. exercise? <laughs> it's true, though. Uh, I also do a lot of professional work with architecture, especially high-end hotels and resorts. And if you show up to professional shoot with a 50 millimeter lens, you're you're in trouble. <laughs> so um, I've had to learn how to see in 16 and 24 to do right. the architecture work. Right. Um, you know, underwater, I've been using mostly the 35, surprisingly enough. Really? So I'm, I, I, underwater, I'm trying to discipline myself. Okay, stick to one lens for yeah. at least a few weeks just so I can learn how to see with that lens underwater. There's no one lens that, that does it all. Um, you can have a photographer that can 
do a lot of things with one lens so you, yeah. you know what i mean yeah yeah um but invest the time in really and you know take the plunge and say okay i'm going uh, the, i'm going on vacation for two weeks to Boracay, which seems like it's going to be a long time before we can do that okay. but uh bring just the one lens and uh, see see what happens another thing that happens when you only have one camera and one lens is that all of a sudden it's always with you because it it becomes a much lighter thing yeah. to carry around you know you're not having to lug a bag a lot of times you see uh people travel with these huge bags huge kit and it's so heavy it just stays in the hotel and they end up using their phone right right, right. okay you know just to be clear guys uh we are not saying that uh, just because we are comfortable with just one lens or Paco's comfortable with one lens that he's uh, you know head and shoulders above the game in terms of skill it's uh, it's just the way you work I, I remember VJ telling me his favorite was the 28 yeah his favorite was the 28 lens. right and underwater my favorite is the 16 for a fish eye I only go down with just one lens but I think there the the, the, the idea behind it is this, you think less underwater with just one focal length, right? Yeah. So you frame better and yeah. everything. But I have tried the 16 to 35, and I'm beginning to love the 35 also because you can get slightly closer, you know, without uh, that much water column between them. And here you can see how Paco interprets everything. Uh, ceilings, there you go. <laughs> there are your ceilings. Yeah, you want to see, yeah. Even cityscapes. Um, right. Now, I have to say, I did cheat a little bit here for length, not for width. So one of the great things about the, the, A7, the Sony a7 III is that you can go on the APS-C mode. So you basically right. crop, you're only using a, a, the center part of your sensor. Okay. So the 55 becomes a, a 75 or an 85, depending on the model. Right. Um, and that's what I did for some of these city shots, just because the city was so far. Right. But it's still, it's only one lens. Um, and even that, you know, that, amazing what technology will let you do um, with these cropping full frame sensors that right. can go APS-C. I always get that question because uh, what is the best lens to use for this or what's I'm, I'm traveling to Hong Kong what's the best uh, lens and you know what you've proven with this uh, set is the best camera or lens is the one that you have with you right yeah. and uh, again like like I said Paco is the master class of <laughs> of grid <laughs> no, well, I, you know the best lens to bring is the one you, you go to your bag and you figure out the lens that you've used the most the one with the most scratches the one that looks like it's been beat up and yeah. that's probably the best lens for you because that's the one you've used the most that's true right? yeah that's one way to look at it well there mm. you go that is your master class session today an hour and 15 minutes of that with Paco Guerrero uh, from grid and wow you just set the tone for the week i mean uh, uh sunny and um miguel have big shoes to fill for wednesday <laughs> i'm sure they're gonna do great i i re i'm tu i'm tuning into that show and i'll be double checking sunny you'll be the uh, troll for that for that uh, no, for as that he's episode. been doing to me yeah yeah fact checker i like to think of myself as a fact checker it's gonna be less pc though i think sunny's a yep, yep a character. for sure <laughs> all right for sure Okay, guys, uh, thank you for watching uh, Behind the Shot. Uh, I know we kind of extended a bit past our 6 o'clock um, slot, but, you know, it's been an amazing conversation with Paco. I do hope you guys learned a lot from, well, not just the projects that he did, but also for the way uh, he has approached those projects, which I think is very unique and something that everyone should listen to and learn. Paco, any words of wisdom, uh, parting words of wisdom for our guests today who tuned in and wow they're really engaged with all the stuff that you showed man amazing <laughs> yeah that's that's good I, you only the comments are always uh, always fun to read um just, just, any parting words uh just thank you sunny. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no thank you for for doing this i think um i think as photographers in in regular daily life uh without coronavirus and without lockdowns we rarely get a chance to interact with each other because we're all off doing our own things that's and, true and um, I've been actually been able to hang out with more photographers more often while on lockdown than, than um, pre-lockdown. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, it's about growing the community. It's about um, realizing that we all have stories to tell. And uh, yes. what we do is just we spend a little bit more time uh, right. to try and learn how to do it. But everybody can. Okay. Uh, and the more of us out there telling stories, I think the better. Okay. Paco, sorry, there's a question here uh, sent to me uh, mm. by chat. Do you uh, hold workshops? Yes. Um, Obviously we, not now, right? We, but 
Yeah, <laughs> you can catch me two ways. Uh, with Sony, Sony's been very supportive of the photo community, usually doing uh, free uh, workshops uh, throughout the year with myself and the other Sony ambassadors. We give talks and we give one-day workshops. So hopefully once the lockdown really clears and we're all able to get uh, to go out again, we'll, we'll restart that. Another way you can catch us on workshops is through Grid. Um, Grid does workshops usually once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. It's it's a bit more involved. Uh, the workshops are about a three or a four day workshop. You get to work wow. with Sunny and Miguel and myself, and you end it with a small little documentary portfolio. Nice. So it, it depends on what level you want to engage, um, where you think you're ready to, to engage right. with us. But we'll, we'll be out there once when things get back to normal. Hopefully. Nice. That's great. We also have, well, Graham Yora is also uh, watching our great guest for the first episode. And that oh, is, Ram. right? The, the cave thing, the diving. Oh, yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. crazy. I hate caves. I hate caves. <laughs> That's why I respect work. I respect the work, man. Are you claustrophobic? Um, had... No, but I, I spent about 12 hours at the Puerto Princess Underground River. Um, okay. We did a shoot for the DOT there. And right. after 12 hours in that cave, I, I'm i not in a rush to go back. So respect <laughs> to you spelunkers and spelunking <laughs> photographers. Wow, I really respect what you do, man. And photographer, pa. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Pushing the envelope, Absolutely. Right? Okay, yeah. guys. If you like this video, please, please like the video itself. And, uh, you know, subscribe and hit that notification bell. You know, it, it might seem like we're just garnering from for likes here. But actually, it pushes the algorithm. Uh, it tells YouTube that people are liking the, the video. And the thing is, the, the, the core objective of Behind the Shot is that people learn more about the work of our very talented photographers and also to inspire those who have been, I guess, burdened with anxiety with, you know, losing their work or source of income. And seeing this, these videos, I would think would help them in a, you know, even in a small way. So please hit that like button. We have 14 likes. Wow. Awesome. Great. <laughs> From seven in <laughs> hey, the support, a few seconds ago. Man, it's it's all going to be about support local, right? Yes, it's that's all true. Be support local. And true. this is, it, this is, this is part of it. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank hit you. the like subscribe yes notification and visit uh studio guerrero on instagram uh yeah check me out also on instagram we you know we chat a lot there also so <laughs> that's how yes, we, 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 we trade barbs uh, if i could plug gridmagazine.ph yeah, go um ahead. website and gridmagazine.ph on instagram um awesome same thing you know, we're up against uh, algorithms. So the more you can like, the more you can subscribe, it really helps get the stories uh, out there. And it's just really a source of inspiration also, guys. So, you know, give the follow for follow. Cool. All right. All right. Paco, uh, please stay in our Zoom conversation. I'll just close the show and I'll get back to you okay. in like five minutes. Right. Okay. Paco, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you, Noel. Thanks, the everybody, show. for all the comments. And Sunny. Thanks, Sunny. <laughs> <laughs> all right bye Paco. bye okay and that was a really really insightful episode with Paco um, I, I don't I kid you not I mean uh, I tease him a lot but really that guy is an amazing photographer and uh, his work has been sort of um, I guess uh, it set the bar for me sometimes when I do my documentary work him and VJ Villafranca sort of have been the inspiration I wasn't supposed to say that on air you know, but, you know, I didn't want uh, Paco to hear that, but, you know, whatever. All right. So for this week, um, this week we have Miguel Nascenseno and Sonny Thakur. This is the only time, no, sorry. This is the first time that we're having two guests in one show. I, I really don't know what I was thinking, but uh, it might be fun. It might be boring. Let's see. Uh, we never take ourselves seriously here. And I think here we are going to push that even further. And finally, we are going to have uh, that episode with Carmen Del Prado. Very talented. Again, I ambushed her again on Facebook and Instagram, asking her to be on the show. We've never met. And, uh, well, she was kind enough to, to say yes. So that is going to be amazing, right? So on Wednesday, we have Miguel Nascenseno and Sanita Kaur, again, from Grid Travel and Adventure Week. Week. Grid is not a travel magazine, but here we are. And uh, it's going to be great. Uh, we're going to go through different uh, points in, in the Philippines uh, where Miguel has been and also to Masbate where um, Sunny has, I think, uh, took a photo of a, a rodeo. Paco's still here. So is it that right, Paco? He was in a rodeo? Yes, that's right. 
Okay, okay, good. We can't hear you, but yes, that was an affirmation from Paco. So again, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for Behind the Shot. And if you uh, are interested in seeing my work on Instagram, just visit Noel Guevara Photo. Thank you guys. Good night, and I will see you on Monday. Ah, sorry, Wednesday. And on Thursday, I am guesting in James Deacon's show. So tune in. I will post the link on my Facebook and also on Instagram. Cheers, guys. See you on Wednesday. <laughs>